Good morning. Got a Wednesday morning here. We got a big house floor we're doing. It's about 3,400 square feet. Got 40 plus yards coming. Just getting going. First truck just showed up, mixed up. So he's priming out the line right now. So as soon as he gets that through, we're gonna we're gonna get started up here on this end. We'll work we'll work our way back over here. Should go pretty good. It's pretty wide open. 3,500 psi. We got mid-range water reducer. Should be able to pour a pretty loose slump on this. Got our battery-powered screed there. So everything should go really well. That's what we're hoping for. We always hope for the best. I haven't gone and see it yet. I get put in there. He's gonna be the new. He's gonna be there. He's gonna be there. Squat in. Is bigger better? And I want to hear from you guys. And just to make sure you guys know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about square footage here. So the square footage in this basement is 3,400 square feet, and that's going to be a finished basement. It's a walkout basement. There's actually a lake right out front of here that you can't see. So 3,400 square feet here. Then there's going to be another 3,400 square feet, obviously on the first deck floor. So that gives them 6,800 square feet of floor space, finished floor space. And I didn't even see the whole house plans. There could be a, there could be another story above this, you know, that that would get them way up over 7,000 square feet in a house. So, you know, is is bigger better? Do you guys like big houses like this, or do you like something a little smaller? You know, what I want to hear from you guys is. You know what's the square feet of the house you live in and are you happy with it would you like something a little bigger or would you like something a little smaller you know and i guess that can kind of depend on where you are in life and what age you're at and if if you've got kids and you know are your kids grown up and moved out but you know if you are specifically speaking right now when you're watching this video you know how many how many square feet of finished house do you have and then would you like something bigger? Would you like something smaller? And then, you know, maybe why, if you want. That would be kind of cool to see in the comments and see everybody's reasons for, you know, if you think this house is too big, would you want a house this big? I mean, 3,400 square feet. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty big house for central Maine, you know, rural central Maine, not really close to a city, kind of out in the woods. Um, but they are on a nice lake, so I guess it's the lot itself is pretty cool. I don't I have no idea what like the property taxes are probably gonna kill them here, but anyway, we're gonna we're gonna kind of go over the pour here. I'll, I'll kind of walk you through what we're thinking about as we're pouring. We came here a few days ago and we shot our grades with the laser level. You know, we snapped a chalk line around. That's me way in the back corner, kind of mag floating the edges to the chalk line. And that chalk line is the same as the top of the wall right here on the on the left, the walkout part. So this is a completely flat floor. Not really any plumbing or anything going down here. Just going to be like, you know, game room, bedroom. There's not really any bathrooms or kitchens or anything going down here. That'll all be on the, the upper floor. And we're pouring a 4-inch thick floor. You know, we're using our regular floor mix, our 3,500 PSI floor mix with water reducer it's got fiber mesh in it a little bit of air in it but it's our same basic floor mix three quarter inch stone and we're pouring on styrofoam most state law in maine you know codes for codes requires two inches of styrofoam pretty much around everything so under the floor you gotta you gotta insulate the foundation it's just the, the cost itself of the styrofoam it's about 50 bucks a sheet you know for a four by eight sheet so it's just crazy, it's crazy expensive to build a house in Maine now. But I guess it's not too expensive for these guys since they're building this humongous thing. I thought I thought my house was pretty good size. My house is about 60 by 32. It's like a split level ranch. I do have a walkout basement like this. So I got, you know, roughly 1,900 square feet in the basement. And that's all kind of pretty much all finished off. And then I got 1,900 square feet on the upper floor. I thought that was, you know, decent size, but <laughs> compared to this, my house is only half this size. And then we're gonna come back, not today, but later on, we're gonna come back. They got a two car garage going in, kind of right in behind where we're working right there where that wall, foundation wall is up there eight feet. And the garage is right up in there. 
So what kind of what we're doing is we like to get all our grades established, you know, so we're striking we're striking our grades, we shoot our what we call our wet pads in the middle with a laser, little round wet pad, and that's right at floor height, and then we strike it off with that hand screed to the to the edges. And that establishes our grade in the middle for us. That gives us something to go by. And we're not just kind of guessing. Because we want this thing to, you know, I, you, I can't say it's perfectly flat, but probably when everything's all said and done, all power trial and sawed, it's probably within an eighth of an inch up and down here and there. And that's, you know, between the, the plus minus error and the laser and then just basic human error. That's not too bad <laughs> to have a floor up and down, maybe an eighth of an inch. And so once we get our grades established, you know, we just, one guy jumps on the screed. We're using MBW's battery powered screed demon there with a 12 foot board. And that's me, that's me running the screed. Then we got Luke and Harvey and Eric kind of puddling, raking. And then Darren's running the bull float. So it's kind of that process. We got 42 yards coming, so four 10 and a half trucks. And the way we like to do things is we just like to dump a 10 and a half truck right out just as fast as we can. You know, get it pumped right out, get it, and then get it out of the way so the second truck can be backing in, mixing up while we're doing this stuff right here. And it just kind of keeps the pour going. And we don't, you know, we don't want a big wait in between when we get done screeding and bull floating and then starting on the next truck. So, you know, we don't want to just dump out five yards off the first truck, get that screeded, dump out another five. <laughs> it's just not the way we like doing it. I mean, there's nothing wrong with anybody that does it that way. But, we, you know, we know what we can do and how fast we can do it. And then we know how much working time we have with the concrete because we work with it every day. So... Dumping ten and a half yards at four inches is going to cover, you know, in the in the ballpark of like eight hundred square feet, eight hundred and forty square feet. When you're the first truck on a pump, it takes about a yard of concrete just to fill up the hopper and the line of the pump. So, you know, if we got ten and a half yards on that first truck, we're really only getting nine and a half out the end of the hose, and the rest of it's staying in the hose. So we gotta we gotta compensate for that when we order concrete too, and that's kind of just it's kind of just wasted after you know after we're all done. The, he just kind of dumps it out at the bottom of the pump afterwards. So that's kind of the process right there. There's the first truck dumped out. You know we just kind of dump it out of the hose, dangle it out of the hose. We call it dangle pumping. A couple guys move it around. One guy's magging edges, one guy's got the, the laser grade stick and he's shooting pads to make sure we're not too high or too low as we're doing this and that just keeps the process moving about as fast as we can. Now he's pumping that probably at medium speed. They got, he can rev that up or he could, he could back it off to go slower. You know, we like going at a pace where as the, as the concrete's dropping down through the pipe and through the hose, it's going at, at a nice even rate and that just makes pumping so much easier the flow makes it go so much easier so you you want to go at a certain speed if you go too slow it, it kind of i don't know it just kind of hiccups in there as it's dropping because that's about a 30 i think he's got a 38 meter boom on that so it goes up from the truck and then turns and comes back down so there's quite a ways that concrete drops this guy, they put these big, huge pads in the middle for, you know, obviously they're a base pad and they're going to hold, you know, be a supporting base for some type of beam they're putting across there. But man, them things were huge. They were, I don't know if I'd call them overkill or not because I didn't really get to see the whole plan, but they must be holding up a lot of weight to be that big. Looks like he ran out of one type of styrofoam. We had to go buy another set. We we don't do the styrofoam, so we didn't do the subgrade. All we're hired to do here today is just pour and finish the floor. So the builder, the guy that's actually building the house, does a little bit of the excavation too. So he's the one that backfilled with the stone, leveled it, compacted it, put the styrofoam down, and then we show up here and we're, we're doing our thing. You can see I'm over there, I'm getting the edges mag. If one guy can get all the edges mag and then get all the grades, the pads in the middle established, it makes things go really fast. Um, if two guys gotta do that, then 
I don't know. That's just kind of a waste of a guy, if you ask me. So one guy that knows what he's doing should be fast enough to do both those things. And then once I get the pads all shot and, and you know, right to grade, then I can jump right back on the screed there with Luke, and we can start screeding our grade pads in the middle. Now sometimes we have bef before, you know, we've screeded a whole floor like this by hand, just like we're doing right now. So we, we still screed these grade pads the same way. But then we just turn the screed like like I do when I'm using the battery screed. We just turn that and kick screed the floor by hand. We're trying not to do that quite as much. I mean, that's how we were all taught. We're trying to use technology a little bit more as we get older. <laughs> but sometimes, sometimes the boys on smaller ones just want to grab the hand screed and just get the floor hand screeded without taking the power screed off the truck. This is a pretty good shot of that screed. Pretty light, you know, it, you can carry it around for for a pretty big pour and not really get tired. Just takes the little M18 Milwaukee battery goes in there. And then the throttle, it's got like a motorcycle grip throttle on it. And I usually run it, I'm probably running it at, you know, medium vibration right now. I don't even, I never really turn it up high. That might be because of the slump we pour with a water reducer in it. You know, we can pour between a six and a seven inch slump, which is really perfect for pouring these residential floors. You know, you want something that's easy to work with, but yet not so wet that it's actually, the screed will actually just kind of sink down in there. If I stopped right now, this slump right here, it would support the weight of the screed. It wouldn't, it wouldn't sink into the concrete at all. Well, the key, to, the key to using a vibrating screed like this is to just go back slow and steady, you know, and let your rakers really do the work. All your job, basically, is to fill your footprints, and I'm watching the two edges, the right side and the left side, making sure each side is leaving a tiny little mark as I'm pulling it back, like a line. That tells me those two edges are right down flat with the, with the grade pads, or what I've previously screeded. I think you can kind of see that line right there on the left hand side and Darren's jumping right in behind me with a bow float and getting that bow floated so as soon as I get done screeding this bay we call this a bay I can jump right over to where he's standing and, and screed that bay that's going pretty good so far you can see the guy that does the screeding probably is the guy that's working the less <laughs> the less hard I guess I wonder how many times I've never counted but you see them guys that are raking the concrete how many times they push and pull back the rake on a job like this I bet it's hundreds I wonder if they have like uh, you know how you have like those walking watches or whatever that measure how many steps you take <laughs> it'd be kind of cool if they measured one for how many times you push that thing back and forth on a job. Oh, well, there's 20 yards right there. Third truck's up there right now. Just gonna get ready to start pumping. That was easy. I mean, with a crew of guys that knows what they're doing, this stuff's pretty easy. It's definitely not intimidating at all. But if you don't know what you're doing, it, I can see where it would be a little intimidating. Just lucky to have such a good crew that, like we have. So some of the things that go through my mind like right about now is first of all so far so good two trucks down you know one right after the other third truck shows up gets all mixed up so there's no real big break in between which is a big big deal when you come to power trial on the concrete um, you want you want the concrete to kind of all dry somewhat evenly and you don't want you don't want half of it to dry twice as fast as the other half you know it just makes the finishing process go a lot better so I'm glad the third truck's out there now. Okay, low is the fourth truck. You know, I want to make sure he's sitting out there waiting because this is only going to take a few minutes for us to dump this one out. So I want him to be up there, you know, just getting ready to go. And I like it when the concrete truck drivers, if, if they do show up and there's a truck ahead of them, if they get out and just come and talk to me and say, hey, Mike, you want me to wait a couple minutes before I mix? Or, or do you want me to mix now? Or, you know, just, just come out and communicate with me as far as what I want don't just go ahead and do what you think I want 
and that makes that makes our lives a lot easier. Sometimes guys will just show up and they'll just start mixing, and you know we won't be ready for them for 10 or 15 minutes. There's no reason to stop mixing. You're just going to heat up the load, and your load's going to end up drying quite a bit faster than the others. So, if you're a concrete truck driver watching, you know, just go talk to the, you know, the head floor guy and just ask him just what he wants. And obviously, what you know, what what we want for a slump, stuff like that's really important. And then, you know, the other thing I'm thinking about is, you know, there's five of us here. Um, Harvey there, the guy in the baseball cap, he's he actually works for himself, so he'll be taken off right after the pour. It's a matter of, okay, I think, you know, Darren and Luke can probably just finish this themselves, just the two of them with uh, the, we got two big 36-inch MBW power trials that we can throw on this and go at it. But it'd be a heck of a lot easier if they had a guy that would be doing their edges while they're power trialing. just makes life a lot easier, so... You know what's going through my mind is do I leave Eric here with him to do their edges or you know me just go check out another job and or get stuff ready for the upcoming week or the following week or do I take Eric with me and maybe we go pour another smaller job or something like that and get two jobs poured today so you know as hot and humid out as it is and if the Sun breaks out even though this isn't huge, I mean, 3,400 square feet isn't, isn't you know, it's a pretty big floor for a lot of guys, but um, as long as Darren and Luke have been finishing, it's not really that big for them, but it's just nice sometimes. It's, it's nice sometimes to have a guy that's just going to just focus on the edges, you know, magging them, steel troweling them, because we like to go over them multiple times. We'll go around these edges probably at least four times by the time they get done power troweling, so the edges look just as smooth as the power troweled concrete. See how easy that is, screeding. Just, life doesn't get much easier than that for a concrete guy that's screeding concrete. It really doesn't get any easier than that. So it's a combination of having a really good uh, vibrating screed, a good operator on the screed, the right slump of concrete, and then two really good puddlers that know exactly exactly the height of the concrete needs to be, you know, as you're pulling it backwards so there's no stopping and starting. You think let me know if you guys think you could run that power screed right there? I mean it's pretty, pretty easy really. It's just a matter of you can see when Darren runs the bull float over that, there's no there's no like gaps under the bull float. Both edges are touching, which means there's no hump under the bull float. That means it's perfect right there. That's exactly what you're looking for. If you gotta go back, if there's dips under that and you gotta go back and throw concrete back in those dips and then re bull float over it, <laughs> that's not really the right way to screed. Your floor is gonna be up and down a little bit. You know, we want we want a tolerance of about an eighth of an inch. I mean nothing's perfect, but we're trying to shoot for an eighth of an inch minimum tolerance on this in that 12 feet. All right, we're at truck number four. Looks like it's gonna be close. He's got 10 on, plus the pump's got about a yard in him. So 11 yards. That section back there, that little rectangle back there, figured about seven and a half to eight. Well, I'm thinking it's gonna do it. We'll see here in a minute. So as we're starting to work on this fourth truck, you know, and we're coming down this, this last stretch, it's always good to see that, okay, he's got, he's got 10 and a half on, and, you know, I know probably, probably nine yards will do this thing, even with that big uh, trench in the middle, that big thick spot in the middle. So it's always a good feeling to know that you're not going to run out, and what, there's a few things that can happen if you run out, you know, sometimes... If you like, we're 45 minutes away. So let's say let's say we did run a half a yard short. So I called our batch man up and I said, Hey Dave, we ran a half a yard short. You know, do you got a truck there? You can send one right another another yard back out because they they really can only batch a, a yard as the smallest amount they want to batch. So he's gonna say, Yeah, yeah, I got one right here. Or Nope, I don't have one. I don't have one coming back. You're gonna have to wait for that one up there to get back here, so he can bring it back. And that's what happens a lot of times because he's already got other jobs scheduled. So, 
you know, not only the, the, the guy has to pull away from the pump truck, he's got to wash his chutes down and then drive 45 minutes back to the plant, back under the, back under the hopper, back under the boot. You know, takes a few minutes for him to load him. He pulls out. He, and whenever the concrete uh, truck usually pulls out from under getting bashed, they usually stop and they rinse off any dust or anything on the truck. So there's a few minutes there. And then it's 45 minutes back to us. So as you're talking well, about two hours round trip to get back here. And I can guarantee you on a day like today, by then we're already power trialing this. Um, and, and maybe not the section that we left off from, but where we first started, we're already power trialing. And the concrete that we did run out on that last truck, that stuff's going to be almost hard enough to walk on by the time that new concrete gets there. So, And then you're trying to blend that wetter stuff into the hard stuff. And it's really a pain. So if you know if I'm if I got ten and a half yards here on this last piece and I use nine, you know, and he's got a yard and a half left on the truck, that's just the way it goes. I don't I don't really stress about that. I I stress more about uh, running out and then trying to figure out like how to fix that than I would sending a yard and a half of concrete back. And it's just part of it's part of doing the concrete, you know, in in a uh, in a state like we're in where we got to drive, you know, sometimes 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes or more away from the concrete plants. You know, the further you are away, the more you want to make sure you don't run out. So if we do waste, if we do waste a little bit of money on them bringing some concrete back, it's a heck of a lot better than, you know, having to spend more money on a small load charge plus the extra yard plus all the time it's going to try to take to try to blend that last piece back into. That beat means he's starting to pump so the, the concrete truck driver knows to put some concrete in the hopper and then the beat means to stop too. Looks like we're going to have plenty. That's a good sign on a big floor like this. Day like today they call for showers later in the afternoon so this should be this should be done power trial sawed by maybe like 1 30 2 o'clock if everything goes right so that's what we're hoping for so i'm going to get this this last bay screeded down what we what we normally do after we get this screeded down is obviously you know we'll get it both load hobbies there both floating it and then once once that's all done we'll bring all the tools up get the tools washed the concrete driver and the pump driver both have water so we just use their water to wash everything up get everything loaded and then the next thing we'll do is we'll go check where we first started, check the concrete, see how firm it's getting to try to determine how much time we got. You know, hey, we got 15 minutes or hey, we, I think we got about an hour. We can run to the store if we need something and come back. So that's typically what we do after the pour like this. Make sure the power trials are gassed up. The blades on the power trials are all good and ready to go. That, that sort of thing. That's kind of what finishing. Now, I didn't get a video of me finishing here, but we're going to finish up. Right, everybody's up there washing up. We got plenty of mud. I'm guessing it's a little overcast today. It's probably 75, 80 degrees. There is a slight chance of a passing shower, so we might have to worry about that. But I'm guessing we got about an hour and a half, maybe two hours before we start power troweling this. So we'll check back in with you then. We'll see how close my guesstimate is and uh, see you in a couple hours.